Coming up, launches. Virgin Galactic moves to 2015. Some solar storms, and we ask you, what is the killer app for space? Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.28 for Saturday, September 13th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is always the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham, and we'll be your hosts for this episode. Now, before we get started, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific episode happen. These are the people who've contributed at least $10 to this specific sode. A huge thank you to everyone on that list. Notice that the list keeps getting longer. Thank you to all the new patrons uh, that have shown up over the last week or so. All right, let's get started with some space news. I've got two uh, units from ch units. <laughs> now a space news is measured in units, apparently. Yay. We've got uh, two from China. The first uh, was uh, a Long March 2D rocket that launched on September 4th at, oh, oh I'm sorry, uh, 15 minutes after midnight, uh, Universal Time, from Launch Complex 43. Um, the, because it's China, for whatever reason, they like to just randomly not give us video. So you have no videos and no stills of this. Uh, but there were two communication satellites on board. It was a... Uh, man, so you know in advance that I suck <laughs> at pronouncing these things. So I apologize, but here you go. Uh -huh. It's the Changwings... 104, which was a communication satellite from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And the second one is the Ling Chao experimental communication satellite from the Tsinghua University uh, in Ling, no, it's Ling Quan? Ling Quan. I, yes, yes Ling Quan. So. I don't know why I said Chao. Ling Quan means agility <laughs> in Chinese. There you go. Cool. Now you've Yay. learned something, or at least I have learned you've something. You've learned bad pronunciations of Chinese. <laughs> I have learned Presented bad. by Benjamin Hagenbach. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So hopefully someone can help us <laughs> with the pronunciation, like spell it out in the, ch in the uh, com comments. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that happened September 4th. And then a little bit later on, September 8th, they launched a Long March 4B. I believe this is an image of that. Uh, this is either the, <laughs> this is one of the two. So this was either the uh, 2D or the 4B. They actually use a common core. So it's a little bit hard to tell them apart um, and at least I don't know the vehicles well enough to be able to tell them apart in a, in a picture so uh, if someone in the comments know can look at that and go oh this is I know that this was one of the two uh, but that launched September 8th at 0322 Universal Time from Launch Complex 39 uh, now this is what China says is a quote a new remote sensing bird that will be used for scientific experiments land survey crop yield assessment and disaster monitoring now if that Quote, sounds familiar. That's because that is the exact line they use every time they launch a military payload. It's actually believed to be a military satellite. It's probably filling in part of the rest of their constellation. Um, so there you go. Those were the two launches from China. But those aren't the only launches this week. Or this last two weeks, I guess. Yeah, we've been gone for we've a week. We've been gone. So you get the last two weeks? Uh, possibly because uh, Aegisat 6 launch from SpaceX. Huzzah! Yeah. Uh, it was September 7th. Uh, Hong Kong time would be 1 p.m., which conveniently is exactly 12 hours difference from Eastern Daylight Time huh. at 1 a.m. That was really nice. Uh, this is the second Falcon 9 launch for Aegisat this year, with Aegisat 8 launching previously on August 5th. Aegisat uh, acquired the first signal from the satellite in Hong Kong about 55 minutes after launch. So far, so good. Everything uh, is reported as being good and online. And this particular satellite had 28 high-powered C-band transponders and a design life for 15 years for video distribution and broadband network services in the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, we happen to have some video, yeah? There you go. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have liftoff of the Falcon 9.
for anyone who cares, that was the 12th consecutive successful launch for SpaceX Falcon 9. And that happened at, uh, so you gave us Eastern Time, so that was 1 a.m. Eastern Time, so that'd be mm -hmm. uh, uh, 5 a.m. Uh, Universal Time. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, more launches. <laughs> I love this launch. The Ariane 5 with MESAT and Optus. Here you go, check it out. Uh, top. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage 2 EAP. Décollage. Gorgeous night launch. That happened on September 11th at 2121 Universal Time from ELA 3A. This was the Ariane 5 61st consecutive successful launch. Now, MESAT is a commercial satellite with direct-to-home television services for, that'd be like uh, your direct TV kind of services for Malaysia, Indonesia, India, and Australia. It's going to hit more than 18 million households. And Opus 10, Optus 10, excuse me, will be same deal, direct cell television broadcast, internet, telephone, and data transmissions for Australia, New Zealand, and the Antarctic region. Now, it would be a shame for me to only show you the beginning part of that video as you saw it there. What you really want to see was this uh, fairly new announcer that they had. We cut out. He he was so excited. What you mean is what you really want to hear. You, what you really want to hear is the, the announcer. Now, we cut out a lot of it, and we, we fed you the best parts. He was really excited over this launch. Here you go. A picture's worth a thousand words. The rumble in the Amazon jungle that you're hearing right now is the Ariane 5 just crossed the, uh, the speed of sound, and now the rumble comes. If you were here, you could feel this building shake as the Ariane 5 roars above us right now. It is one incredible, look at that view on the camera. Look at that baby move out on the, uh, uh, on the screen and it is still shaking and rumbling. We've lost 600 tons. What a Weight Watcher diet. <laughs> I, that's that's my favorite. Every time I hear the "What a Weight Watcher diet," I bust out laughing. Uh, I actually uh, I love that announcer. <laughs> they need to bring him back every time. That was amazing. It was almost like a sporting event. He clearly loved the rocket. I akin to wrestling. I it, a little bit like wrestling. I thought that was absolutely amazing. I absolutely love that launch coverage. He made that launch coverage exciting, and that's in my opinion how it should be exciting cool stuff this is the most exciting epic thing humanity is doing and he had that energy behind it i loved it all right moving along uh so for the first time in recent recollection richard branson recently told david letterman that they will not be flying until 2015. now we can't show that because of copyright of so course you hit what like hulu where can you go to see the clip uh yes uh, cbs.com i believe we can sure. hit the actual david okay, cool. letterman clip uh, but the reason it's so significant is because forever and ever and ever, besides the famous in just six more months, six more months, we're six months out, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this is the first time that Branson has kind of not said it something along the lines of by the end of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, during the conversation, he's talking about how Branson himself will be on the first flight from New Mexico, from New Mexico presumably, of course, from the spaceport that's there. It will be he and his family, and that will be uh, the first flight, of course, after all of the test flights. Uh, he did make an odd other sort of, um, it wasn't an announcement, it was really sort of a throwaway line for him, but he said that the first flights are to, quote, make you astronauts, and then Virgin Galactic will move on to orbital flights, and then continue on to moving to point to point around the world, which would be really, really kind of cool. So it's interesting that he said orbital, not not suborbital, no, but orbital. No, he said orbital, and I, I was really fascinated by that. So while this is kind of like not really a news story per se, it's one of the first times that we've heard Richard Branson himself talk about Virgin Galactic in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, very candid. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with David Letterman, he kind of has this slight stuttering way of presenting things, and uh, I had never seen Richard Branson speak I guess off the cuff, and he mm -hmm. also has a very sort of stuttering so way. So lots of stuttering. <laughs> so 
it was it was interesting and it was entertaining um it, it was cute but it was just it was uh not something we'd ever heard from virgin galactic before and not that richard branson necessarily speaks for virgin galactic but at the same time it's his company so i sort of feel like he kind of speaks for so the virgin christmas galactic. flight in 2014 is out it sounds like it's totally now out it's, they're it's really march looking 2015 at, yeah they're looking at somewhere between february and march of 2015 that's a little bit of a bummer, but at the same time, it's still like not these really far distant. Yeah, and the best part was that David Letterman, Letterman himself sounded really surprised. Richard Branson said, yeah, we're looking at like February, March 2015. And David's like, wait, 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 wait. So this spring, you're going to get on a flight and be in space. And uh, so it, it, it's so funny how those of us inside of the space community feel like, oh, when is this going to happen already? And then there's a whole generation or a whole, you know, subgroup of people who are outside of the space industry that are like, wait, wait, wait. So just like early next year, you're just already going to do this? Yeah. So that, that was kind of a cool thing to say. But... Well, it's us and the 800 ticket buying ticket people, whatever <laughs> words I yeah, want to use there. Yeah. The people who have purchased tickets on Virgin yeah, Galactic going, who are, oh, oh come on, do it let's go. But at the same time, you don't want to be like, let's go, I don't care about safety. It's, let's right. go, but safely. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, I prefer them take a little bit of time and, and get it done right, absolutely. Yeah, so speaking of those of us who are very interested in, in getting into space, whether it be in a suborbital fashion or orbital or beyond, uh, X-Core is actually starting to sell tickets to the wealthy Chinese. Uh, according to New York Times article do you really need to say wealthy isn't well, it just yeah, assumed no, we, that you're wealthy if you're buying a ticket to space yeah i suppose <laughs> uh, yes i suppose that's it's uh that's a given isn't it anyway but i just i literally copied and pasted the headline so i apologize <laughs> those aren't my words that's what it actually said. Uh, according to a New York Times article, 30 Chinese people have put down at least a 50% payment for a ride on x hopefully late next year. At least that's what x is saying by the end of 2015. Uh, Dexo Travel, which is based in Beijing, said that one in every 10 tickets that are sold to x at all are booked uh, or have been booked through Chinese people or have been booked by Chinese people is what I'm trying to say. Um, Alex Tang, the chief executive of x Aerospace Asia operation said, there are wealthy people everywhere in the world, but there are not so many wealthy people who also have a dream to go into space, but that China has a lot of them. Hmm. I just thought that that was really fascinating that of all of the tickets that are being sold by x a huge, 10% isn't like gigantic, but that are very specifically from China. I thought that that was cool. Well, there's another interesting... Not to uh, mention that this is also, by the way, I, I apologize. This is two years after x has already been selling tickets other places in the world. Does right. that make sense? Because ITAR makes it really hard. And yeah. what's interesting is, as I understand it, Virgin Galactic does not sell tickets in China because of ITAR. Yep. But x under those exact same ITAR laws, has a different interpretation. Right. Of, and this goes to the heart of some of the ITAR problems, is trying to interpret where you can actually do these things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe Virgin Galactic will start flying or uh, selling tickets in China sometime. Uh, you know, same deal. It's, they both it's, have to start flying first, though, eh? Yeah, eh? Like. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it feels like we're really close on each. I know, I yeah. know, we have said that for like six years now. Right. But I mean, for realsies, I you know they're going to fly sometime. Right. Yeah. So cool. Um, all right. Uh, before we go into break, there you've probably heard in the news that there was a ginormous solar storm. It's gonna kill us all. <laughs> yeah. Well, not really. So <laughs> here's what it looked like. Uh, I think this was SDO based on the images. I'm just assuming this is SDO. Mm -hmm. uh, this happened on September 10th. It was an X, -cla X class coronal mass ejection. Wow. A CME. Yeah. yeah exactly. Fast. No kidding. Um, now the leading edge of that flare actually already arrived at Earth. That happened uh, Friday mid-Friday in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in New England, in the Great Lakes areas, kind of the Dakotas, Washington, Oregon, you're going to get some amazing auroras. It's going to look awesome. So definitely at night, go out there and check it out. Now, there's been, there's been some talk of like, how's this going to impact us? What are the, some of the ramifications? Now, space weather is a big deal. It absolutely impacts things here on Earth. Mm -hmm. It can impact even our electrical grid if it's a really serious uh, issue. Now, th this isn't, right? So this is right. not something that's going to impact satellites. Satellites are hardened against space weather. Yeah. And uh, there are levels of that, so... Well, even the Inter International Space Station isn't, like, really taking... Yeah, action. even... Yeah, exactly, right? So the International Space Station, the astronauts aren't even really doing anything. Now, in a, in a higher class uh, problem, they would move in some of the hardened areas of the mm -hmm. space station. They're not even doing that for this. So, you know, it's cool to look at and cool to talk about, but right now, this particular space weather event isn't something that is 
going to be critical to anyone here on Earth. Right. They can be, and it's something that we should watch. I've always wanted to have a space weather segment mm. in tomorrow. I think that'd be kind of cool, but these events don't happen that often. But we are kind of nearing that solar maximum cycle. The mm. sun goes through cycles, and we're kind of entering that maximum area. So uh, there you go. That, that happened. Nothing <laughs> to worry about. Carry on. Uh, you know, actually, let's do this last one before we go to break. Uh, sure. This is the, uh, this is the zero, <laughs> zero G engines. So, zero G, uh, for zero G Corp, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar, go zero G.com. Uh, you can take a parabolic flight for right around $5,000 or so. Uh, and that's as a personal uh, individual or as a personal company, you know, can buy flights. But they also have a, a, an exclusive contract with NASA to fly their astronauts on these parabolic flights. And, and that's to test, you know, you kind of go up, you come down, and you get a little half second or so of zero G, et cetera, et cetera. I, I suppose it's not a half second, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so a huge shout out to Doug Messier from ParaboliceArc.com, who went through untold numbers of legal documents oh. to break down this particular issue. It's, what's happening is that Zero G leases their engines from a company called Amerijet. Uh, their Boeing 727 uh, or, or jet engines for the, their Boeing 727 airplane. Um, Amerijet has basically taken back their engines uh, for a disagreement that comes across the uh, for breaches in the management services and engine lease contracts, uh, and they're seeking to recover unpaid fees, expenses, and damages of just over one hundred and twenty thousand. $127,000. Uh, this has been going on for the majority of this year. So for those of you who have the money or really wanted to get a ride on a zero G plane and have been trying to book a ticket and haven't been able to, this might be why. But they have been flying because Vax, we just last show had Vax on a zero G flight. And I assume it was, well, maybe it wasn't because you can do parabolic flights through other people through other people yeah. right there go zero g isn't the only one so maybe it wasn't them right but usually so, it is right so well, vax is in the chat room right so yeah so vax say so. on on did you take the zero g plane and if so then that means that they are still in fact flying right my understanding is that this particular and it might just only be one plane i don't i don't think that they had a fleet but okay so vax is saying no it was with on, on a nasa c9 ah. okay so my understanding is that this particular plane is basically been hijacked and it's in Texas. Not hijacked, but I mean it's in Texas. Wrong I'm sorry. Issues. I'm so sorry. It's been grounded and it's in Texas. Uh, when Amerijet started uh, their first lawsuit, uh, it happened to be in Texas. They were saying, okay, cool, we're going to come take our engines. You guys aren't going anywhere. Zero G was like, that's neat, you guys, but so, no, we can totally still go places. And it's, it's been this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, because they've been grounded, Zero G has come back to Amerijet and said, cool, well, now that you've grounded us, we are, with our unpaid fees of this, that, and the other, we are owed about $127,000 or so as well. So they're trying to just sort of zero, no pun intended, everything out. <laughs> uh, Amerijet uh, then filed a different suit uh, at a different... Oh man, so a bunch level. of legal stuff. Back yeah, it's and forth. all the stuff. It's so crazy, but it it that's that's what it comes down to. Amerijet not happy, said that there's a breach of contract, wants their engines back. Zero G said, well, then come and get them, but it's going to cost you, and or we can just break even. There's a whole other lawsuit in, in uh, Florida, blah, blah, blah. Right, But bunch that's of legal what's going stuff. on, and they still haven't posted any flight schedule for 2015 yet. Here's hoping they fix that up, because <sighs> uh, getting people excited in space, this is one of those easy ways, because getting a ticket into space is still excessively expensive hundred thousand dollars two hundred fifty thousand dollars it's just very expensive but a zero g parabolic flight that's about five thousand dollars or so now still right. expensive but at least you can kind of experience sort of what it would be like and kind of have some of that fun and uh, you know uh anything that helps that experience i'm all for so here's hoping they work it out i don't know who's right or who's wrong but you know here hopefully they'll work if you it want out. more details please 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 parabolic please visit parabolicarc.com it's got all of the information you could possibly ever want about it all right we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we're going to be talking about our main topic which is what is the killer app for space stay with us we'll be right back Love.
and welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with this week's main topic of the killer app for space, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $5 to this specific episode, and uh, it, it, it's absolutely astounding how many people are helping to make this show go week after week. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. You can get more information on how to become a patron over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O, and each different level that you subscribe to has different rewards. Think of it like a, a Kickstarter for the show, but on a per episode basis. Uh, and we didn't have a show last, I think it's a super fair way of doing this, right? We did mm -hmm. not produce content last week. Right. Unfortunately, I was out sick, which means uh, all of our patrons, you pay nothing for last week. There is no fee for no show. We have to produce a show in order for you to... Uh, 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 contribute. So again, thank you to all of our patrons. All right. Our uh, topic for this week is what is the killer app? Killer app. You got to use uh, like web 2.0 trend uh, words. What? It's, it's, it's what the tech community knows. I feel like... Synergy. It, cohesion. I feel <laughs> like uh, the tech community is kind of the first... You have that kind of pyramid, yes. right? Of like influencers and, you know, it trickles down to the general populace. Well, uh, you, you've got the already pre-existing space community. Chances are you're watching tomorrow either live or on demand. Uh, or and in one case as a co-worker to fall asleep to. Hey now. So thanks for that. Uh, and NASA TV is great for that as well. <laughs> If you ever need a tip, I have actually done that. Um, but then you've got underneath that uh, like core space group, you've got the techno geeks, right? Mm -hmm. The the ones who are just hanging off of every word from the Apple keynote, watching that live. Um, and they have every gadget. They're going to get the Apple Watch. They've already got a Moto 360, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're kind of, once space starts becoming available to them, I think they're the next core crowd. So using that terminology, what's the killer app for space, you know? Makes a lot of sense for this show. And I was talking to the chat room in advance, and we were kind of coming up with a few ideas. Uh, one of the things, so for those who don't know, there are many different things you can do in space. One of them is space-based solar power. So imagine re relieving our uh, dependence on fossil fuels. Yes. And being able to beam sunlight down from space mm -hmm. as energy, mm -hmm. like focused energy, and then send that to households. Obviously, that only works... 12 hours out of the day or so, right. you'd have to actually, maybe using mirrors, you could bounce it around the earth. The problem right. with the technology is it's super hyper inefficient, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you're basically, you're basically, uh, forgive me because I don't know it that well, but I believe you're converting it using photovoltaics up in space, turning it into like an RF kind of energy, right. beaming it back down to the ground and then turning it back into a usable energy and you lose a lot of that Um when, when you're doing that. But that could be kind of cool, right? Because utilizing the sun is a great way, just in general, to help everyone's life. Right. Because electricity is kind of one of those core things that any modern civilization needs. Yeah. And it's one of those things that uh, we use so much oil right now right. to maintain, and, and coal and, and just these fossil fuels, that we need something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's photovoltaics on the ground. Maybe it's space-based solar power. I'm not sure, but that's one potential killer app. Uh, Dada, have you heard anything space-based solar power-wise that is actually real by chance? Just randomly ask the control room. No, I don't. I'm not familiar with it. All right, cool. There you go. Uh, the second one, resource gap. Resource gathering. You were talking about like uh, uh, mining, right? Yeah, Asteroid absolutely. Mining. Absolutely. Planetary resources, that sort of idea. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Uh, well, and then uh, I assume that means you're also talking about maybe mining, uh, say, on the moon or Mars. Sure. That sort of. Absolutely. The concept. resources, we've got finite resources on Earth and infinite resources in space. Mm -hmm. So as we run out of things on Earth, uh, we can, most elements on Earth, are available, with the exception of things like oil, are available out yeah. in space. So, and actually, there's a possibility of finding oil in space if you have the exact same conditions that were available on Earth mm. to have those out in some other distant planet somewhere. Sure. That is an unreasonable expectation because it would have to be an Earth-like planet with... Um, you're not getting it back. It's not a real thing. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just 
cut that right there. That's not a real thing. But um, other things uh, out there like uh, helium Mm -hmm. three, mining that from the moon or from other planets. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got water Mm -hmm. out there, and you could turn water into rocket fuel for use for uh, exploration. Although we're in a huge drought here in California, wouldn't it be nice if we could get some get some water down here? Yes, (laughs) that would. I don't know if that how realistic that is actually. Moon water, preferably. You know, there are precious metals up there as well. Uh, there's uh, platinum, titanium. Mm. Uh, there are diamonds out there. I mean, yes. there's there's just a bunch of stuff uh, that's that's out there. Vacationing, Ooh. right? So who wouldn't love to go to a Bigelow habitat? Mm-hmm. It, you know, uh, for those who don't know, Bigelow is actually a real estate tycoon here in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, he has uh, created one of the areas he wants to go to from a real estate standpoint is. Uh, space. He has created an inflatable habitat based on NASA technology, and he will be flying one to the International Space Station, one of these habitats, to the space station uh, next year? It's Yeah, it's within the next couple of years. It's pretty soon here. Uh, so, uh, But it doesn't have to be on space station. He, he can build, he, using his modules, he could build a giant space station that you could, not as long as you could get there, which is part of the problem today, you could actually... Um, go in and, and vacation on a space station awesome. floating over Earth, right? Experience zero G. What if you? What if we had a colony on the moon? Ooh. Right? Wouldn't you want a vacation on a hotel on the colony on the moon? Yeah. And then, of course, uh, exploration and discovery. This is, uh, you know, Dada brought this up, you know, as he said, boldly go where we haven't gone before. Right. I feel like from a killer app standpoint, we've made that, we've made that um, kind of general concept mm-hmm. since the Apollo era, and it hasn't stuck. Mm-hmm. So my question to the community and kind of for the topic is, what is the killer app that's going to stick? What's the thing that's going to actually make everyone else go, oh, this is a thing I want to and open up space to everyone, right? Space-based solar power. Okay, suddenly let's just say we get it to work and it actually makes sense and it reduces your energy costs. People don't necessarily care that it's coming from space, but you need to right. open up space to enable it. Right. And now everyone wants it, potentially, right? So a lot of assumptions there. Um, resource gathering, same deal, right? Oh, I want to be part of the thing that helps us, you know, I, I want more something or this makes my life better because I get more X, Y, or Z. Right. Or it lowers the cost of, you know, whatever. Right. Um, vacationing. Although right now the price of doing that would be insane, but a little bit. But um, w- bragging rights, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, wouldn't it be awesome if like, sure. oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm going on a cruise in the Bahamas. How about you? Oh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to the moon for a week. How awesome? Well, it'd be two weeks. How awesome is that? <laughs> right? Because you're there and back. Unless you're going to the moon for a day, I guess. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I just I just went for the gift shop stuff. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I mean, space, so devil's advocate, right? Go for uh, it. Space-based solar power, uh, interesting thing. You and I most recently were looking for um, a, a, an ultra-green community here in the Los Angeles sort of area. Yeah, possibly, we wanted a place that had, like, photovoltaics. Right, to possibly right? move into, you know, Recycled the, uh, water. Water. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, all of that stuff, you know, uh, high efficiency all of that fun stuff. Oh man, have we become Californianized if we want that? A little bit. Oh, that's not good. A, a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think if you could get a space-based solar power to work here on the ground and, and it actually reduces the cost of X, Y, or Z, whatever it is, right? Whatever, mm-hmm. um, whether it be your heating bill, your cooling bill, your water bill, your electricity bill. It makes your life better somehow. Yeah, if it makes your life better in a significant way. Not just, if it's pennies on the dollar, I, I just don't think people are really going to care all of that much. I think that's uh, one of the sort of issues with, um, you know, I think Tesla's doing an amazing job with the all-electric car, uh, but I think people are just so reluctant. You know, the hybrids, Prius, the plug-in hybrid, right, is is one of the best-selling hybrid cars uh, ever. Ever, it's Over ridiculous. Four million sold. Because and I, and I don't really understand why. I mean, maybe it's because people just they they think smaller is better, or I think it's, it's I think it's two sold things. Longer time, or I think it's two things. It's uh, people want to feel like they're they're not damaging the environment and doing right. something better, right? Um, but then also, which is true-ish with a Prius. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is uh, they want the added benefit of better gas mileage because it ends up costing them less. You know, there's a direct impact yeah, on there, their wallet. There's, yeah, there's, right, so they can feel a little bit in this pile and a little bit in mm-hmm. that pile. Yep, I'm so, saving money and helping the planet. Why aren't you? Right, so I think I think space-based solar power is the same kind of 
thing. It mm-hmm. would have to be uh, significantly cheaper or, you know, make you feel significantly better about yourself sure. in some way for that to really take it, off. But it could, couldn't it? I mean, it, 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 well, even yes, wait, it actually, could. does it have to be cheap? Well, or it, could, it could be either or, right? Either or, yeah. It could be more expensive, but it has zero impact on the environment. Right. Think of it like a Tesla, right? A Tesla right. is really expensive, but it's like a zero emissions car. Right. So, and it's it's it has to be really good too. It can't be flaky. Oh, That's yeah, the other yeah, thing yeah. with a Tesla, right? Is right. it's a great car that's very expensive and great for the environment or much better than a, a fossil fuel burning car. Uh, Nano Aircraft in the chat room says, I'm charging my phone with the sun right now. That's awesome. You can do that though, right? I mean, they have yeah. photovoltaic solar panels that let you do that. Yeah. Uh, you could, uh, you know, you could do that for the main power for your house if you can figure out that other 12 hour issue, right? The right. nighttime issue. Right. And maybe that's batteries, you know, maybe that's batteries. I don't know. But the problem with va- batteries is that's a finite resource too. Sure. So then we move into resource gathering. I mean, it, it, I don't know. I, I'm not a chemist and I, so I don't even pretend to be. But if there are resources uh, in space that we can mine on, say, asteroids or other or other, uh, I was going to say foreign bodies, you know what I'm trying to say, uh, like moon and Mars, etc., that would help us make better batteries down here on mm-hmm. Earth, um, then yeah, I think that something like that could also really catch on, uh, really go further. Uh, you know, trying to get water in space really doesn't help you until you're already out in space. Sure. I mean, there's only so much water. Yes, we have a huge drought here in California right now, but a, a good portion of the world isn't in the crazy drought that we're in. So they're probably not necessarily as focused on that. Uh, you know, places like Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, they... You know, you can't walk 20 feet without stepping in another lake. Uh, so th- they're probably not thinking so much about water particularly, but other other uh, minerals and elements and what have you that are out there that we could help us down here. If somebody can create the business case for it, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I have no good ideas. I, I apologize at the moment. I don't think anyone does, right? I mean, uh, we haven't found that killer app yet. Sure. I mean, bringing that down here, it's, it's making, it's again, making that easier, faster, quicker, and cheaper, overall cheaper mm-hmm. uh, for anyone down here. Better, better. Yes. So be- either everything just has to be- higher quality or better for the environment or yes. both. Yes, yes. Or cheaper. I don't think it has to be both of those at the same time. Now, if you can hit, no, but if you if can, you can hit all three that would of those, be the killer app. Yeah, if you can hit all three of those, if you can make right? it better, yeah. uh, you can make it cheaper, mm-hmm. and you can make it good for the earth, mm-hmm. uh, then, yeah, that's kind of a no-brainer. That would be the thing. And I'm not sure what the... So I, I guess, now, our question to you, the community, uh, we've discussed what we think. Space-based solar power, resource gathering, vacationing in space... Um, so resource gathering, there's a great conversation in the chat room right now over helium three. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the advantage of helium three is you could create, um, um, what fusion power, right? Uh, fi- no, uh, you could create, fi- we have fission. So I don't know. you, you can yeah, create very works. clean power <laughs> right. using helium three, yep. uh, except that we haven't actually worked out how to make the reaction output more power than you have to input. But we could someday, and especially if we had a lot more helium-3, we could figure out how to do that. So uh, Yeah, BZ Wing Zero says helium-3 is worthless until we have viable fusion. Fusion power, yeah. Um, so um, helium-3, vacationing, and then, of course, the, the old-school exploration and discovery, going out there to the stars, exploring, discovering new things, and just in general learning new stuff about the cosmos. But what are the other killer apps? Maybe there's something we didn't mention. Those are the sure. easy ones that we know of. What do you think the killer apps are and why? And what will it take for one of these killer apps to take off? And is it even viable? Like mm-hmm. space-based solar power? Not sure it's actually viable. It sounds great. It's fun right, to talk right. about. You could go, oh, look at the amazing things we could do in space until you actually start running the numbers and going, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right? It's like a space elevator. You're like, that sounds really cool. Doesn't make a lot of sense, okay. actually. So what do you guys think? Leave your comments on the Patreon page, patreon.com slash TMRO. On our Reddit page, actually, that's an amazing community that is really starting to, to flourish. It's great what you guys are posting over there. That's at reddit.com slash r slash TMRO. It's our official forum. It's the official place mm. for you guys to talk about stuff. Or Of course, you've also got our website at TMRO.TV. Now, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from our last show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome future patrons of Tomorrow. If you're not familiar with who Tomorrow is, we're a live weekly webcast about the cosmos and human exploration of the stars. We'll feature things like rocket launches, 
We'll have guest interviews. We'll have amazing conversations about the cosmos. And of course, an interactive chat room so that you can not only talk with other like-minded cosmic explorers, but also us, the hosts of the show as well. And we're just generally excited about humans exploring space. And we're here on Patreon as a way to crowdfund the show itself because this isn't something that a normal network would pick up, but it is something that a lot of us are really, really excited about. For those of you not familiar with Patreon, think of it like a recurring Kickstarter, a way for you to contribute to the show, but on a per episode basis instead of just once. Now you can contribute whatever amount you feel fit for these episodes, but once you start hitting that $1 mark, we're gonna start giving rewards back to you. At $1, you'll get your name in the credits. At $5, you'll get your name in the credits. Plus, you're gonna get a exclusive Google Hangout. At $10, you get even more stuff. Contribute what you feel is fair. Now, you know what I said, this is on a per episode basis, and we do have more than one episode per month. So if you wanna make sure that you don't spend too much money per month, you can set an upper level cap. For example, you can contribute $5 per episode, but no more than $25 per month. Or you can contribute $1 per episode, but no more than $10 per month, whatever fits your budget. And if you'd like to see where your crowdfunded contributions are going, check out our goals. We're always getting new equipment. We're trying to do cool new things with social media. We're trying to do some amazing things in this space. And each goal helps us get closer and closer to realizing one of those new things. With the help of you, our patrons, we can make this show truly something special. And let me be the first to welcome you to tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our comments from our last show, I want to give a huge shout out to the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this specific segment go. These are the Patron Plus members. These are people who have contributed at least three dollars or more to this episode. Now, as one of the rewards for the three dollar plus uh, uh, level, you actually get access to the After Dark episode right away. So as soon as we post it, it goes up on the Patreon Plus uh, Patreon page. So if you're at Plus, if you're at Producer or Premiere level or above, you're going to get access to that episode right away. And uh, you can get more information on that at patreoncom slash T-M-R-O, but oh no, there's more. The patron subscribers, these are people who have contributed one dollar. Look at how long these lists are getting. It's these crazy. are people who have contributed one dollar to this specific episode. Over 70 people contribute one dollar to this specific episode. Yeah, absolutely. And growing. And uh, the special rewards for that, you get access to a Google Hangout. Um, and, and of course, uh, your name in the show. A couple of other things. More information on all of that. Patreon.com slash TMRO. Again, you guys are the lifeblood of this show. We could not do this without you. It's it's a, it's a huge help to keeping us uh, broadcasting week after week. All right, let's go ahead and get started uh, from our last show, uh, this first comment. Uh, which comes from our Reddit page, so reddit.com slash r slash TMRO. This is Martian in a Human's Body. I think the whole industry will take off, pun, yes. <laughs> Once the reusable flights by SpaceX give us the dramatically reduced prices to space, it's hard to predict which industries will come out, but there will be some and they will need others to jump in. Um, yes, uh, you know, so the, the concept being that reusability is the key that's going to make things go. Sure. Let us not forget that the space shuttle also promised reusability. Yep. It was what was going to bring the cost of... You're watching too much Archer over Sorry. there? Is Sorry. that what that was? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, it is what is going to bring the cost of space flight down, and it never succeeded in doing that. So... While SpaceX is doing awesome things, there's no guarantee. Obviously, these are my personal opinions and not that of anyone else. Um, uh, but there's no guarantees on anything. Yeah. Uh, we're hopeful. We're very, very hopeful that that's yeah. what happens. And hopeful it's not just SpaceX. Maybe, uh, you know, Firefly Space Systems talked about uh, doing um, reusability or at least building it with the idea of reusability. And then you've also got uh, Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. their, their transport up to the space station for CCI cap and CCT cap and all those weird little acronyms, acronyms for for basically there for the NASA commercial crew yeah. a transportation of the space station it's a reusable space plane now it flies on a Atlas V which gets thrown away but there's no reason it couldn't fly on a F9 or an F9R at least I don't think there is I don't know uh, so yeah. anyhow yeah so I guess my point is it's awesome we're excited about it yes. but 
we haven't been able to, we as humanity has not been able to execute on it just yet. This new space industry might be able to make it happen. Uh, actually, another great example, mask and space systems. Mm -hmm. he ha his vehicles are reusable, and he's doing some pretty cool things. But they're lander-sized right now, so they're, right. Not, they're not big enough. Uh, but his DARPA challenge stuff, that, that's, mm. that's, a big, that's a big one. So we'll see. All right, next up. Uh, also from our Reddit slash TMRO, uh, Tom Westcott says, there are many ways to expedite new space, but the one thing all the effective actions will have in common is that they create and provide new goods and services to the great mass of the Earth's population who really don't care one way or another about space. You know, that, that's an, pretty it, much exactly what we were just talking about. It's exactly right? what we were just talking <laughs> about is, is you can hit the space geeks, you can even hit some of the technology geeks, the, mm -hmm. the people at the top of that pyramid, but in order for it to trickle all the way down, it's going to have to impact humanity in some way that a normal citizen cares about it right and it's gonna have there's going to have to be something there for them mm -hmm. otherwise they're gonna be like whatever this doesn't impact me at all right right all right next up uh, Chris Howlett from YouTube says, uh, we need more people like Elon Musk who are willing to take risks and set up companies like SpaceX. There's no point planetary resources being set up and then having no demand for their products. Well, I mean, one could argue that, so, you know, planetary resources is an asteroid mining company. Mm -hmm. One of the things you're looking for first is water, and that's going to enable the exploration of the universe when you right. really think about it, because the most important thing in space is water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, there was a great example in some show or something, which was, if you're in space mm -hmm. and uh, you're at an asteroid and you have lost everything mm -hmm. what do you care about more do you want a glass of water to survive mm -hmm. or do you want that platinum right hmm. right so uh, that and that, there's lots of asteroids everywhere everywhere and you can <laughs> you can use water for a bunch of different things um not just drinking water yeah uh, you can use it to create rocket fuel it is the enabler for the rest of the solar system um I think there are people like Elon Musk that are taking risks, but Elon Musk is a bit of a superstar, uh, right? I mean, he's, yeah. he's kind of that billionaire superstar, but yeah. there are other people in new space that are taking risks. You look at some of these right. Google Lunar X Prize teams, a lot of them are taking risks as well. Yes. Dave Mastin, another great person who I'd say is a risk taker, mm -hmm. uh, taking calculated risk, not unnecessary risk. There's oh, a difference yeah, yeah, between yeah. the two. Uh, but taking calculated risks and doing some very innovative things in, in space. Um, and there are other ex examples of that. Well, actually, Richard Branson also calculated risk. Mm -hmm. When you look at Virgin Galactic, there is risk there. It's mm -hmm. not this easy, super easy, suborbital, reusable well, and thing. I don't think it all has, has to be about risk per se. Calculated risk. Either way, I, I don't think it has to be about... Uh, uh, it doesn't all have to be about risk, whether it's calculated or not, right? Okay. Um, there's There are... Minor holes and little areas that need to be fulfilled. Uh, Jason Dunn with Made in Space is, is a great example. Oh, yeah? Right? 3D printing in space. We mm -hmm. keep talking about it like it's just a thing that's going to happen. He's one of the people who's making it happen. Right. You know that's going to be necessary for. It's going to be crazy necessary. Stuff and there in space. aren't a lot of people who are doing it right mm -hmm. now. So I think there's a lot of areas like that that we just sort of existentially assume is going to happen food in space right mm -hmm. you know you see star trek and and we have a, a replicator thank you replicator i'm like neelix does the thing um <laughs> you have the replicator but that's it's not it's not a real thing yet or anything similar to mm -hmm. that yet um so i think there's a lot of areas where i don't believe that there's a huge risk and uh something like that like a, a food something that can be space food that's what i'm trying to say uh can still be used down here on earth in a lot of different ways uh you know that's kind of where the mre sort of thing kind of came from um so I, I don't know uh, MRE. um uh meals ready to eat thank you meals ready to eat uh military term i apologize acronym no acronym policy uh but uh, my point being that we keep talking about these people who are taking these great risks, calculated or otherwise, and to really move things forward. And those people are needed, but there's also the other people who are not necessarily taking risks, calculated or otherwise, that are still also really moving us forward. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right, next comment. Um, comes from Will B. from YouTube. How do you expedite the space gold rush? It's quite simple economics, really. In the absence of a government organization, be it military or civilian, setting a goal and backing it with billions, like in the Apollo era, people need a reason to go out into space and justify the extreme cost. Um, but I think part of it is, you, in the new space era, there isn't, the point is, it's not 
throwing billions at this, right? Right. It's, it's, saying, not, it's not billions of dollars behind a single monopoly. Well, behind a government agency, essentially, right? It's, sure. It's smaller companies doing far less expensive programs right. that are measured you know, in millions instead of billions, ideally. Um, now, it's still very expensive, but it's not nearly the cost that it was before. So, you know, uh, it is certainly simple ec economics in that a company needs to make money, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's the same level that it was back in the Apollo era. Right. If that makes sense. I, I think so. All right. I'm sure the chat room will let us know if it doesn't. <laughs> in about 30 seconds. <laughs> right? Flag. <laughs> All right, next up. Uh, also from YouTube, this is Trent Waddington saying, nothing succeeds like success. More new space companies need to fly. Yeah, I mean, uh, the more companies you have doing it, the more, you know, all ships rise with the tide yep. kind of comment. I don't necessarily disagree with that. You, you definitely, the more success you have, the better it is. Um, I, I would argue that we need companies willing to take, I don't want to say risk per se, but they need to be willing to create craters if they're creating launchers right. or be willing to, to fail. I love the Silicon Valley mentality mm -hmm. uh, of um, fail often, fail hard, and then move on mm -hmm. and learn from that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you don't strive for failure, but mm -hmm. if, if you're going to fail... You know, learn a lot from it. Fail hard. Learn a lot from it, and then and then tweak it and fix it and make it go. Right. And aerospace is so risk averse right now yeah. that it's freakishly expensive to do things. Yeah. It takes decades to get anything done. Don't do that anymore. Don't do that anymore. Fail early. Fail hard. You know, it's funny. Uh, you and I both read the exact same words and had a completely different take on it. Okay. Uh, in my mind, nothing succeeding like success. Nor more new space companies need to fly, I feel like that's a, kind of a trickle-down effect to a certain extent, okay. right? So uh, say Virgin Galactic starts flying in early 2015, X-Core starts flying in late 2015. By 2017, 2020 even, uh, it will be relatively commonplace for still, it'll be relatively expensive, but it'll still be relatively commonplace to hear of people saying, oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're taking an X-Core flight next week, mm. so sorry, can't come to the baby shower. Uh, and it's not going to be such a weird, crazy, like, it's not going to be Is making... Is that a valid excuse? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Ask any pregnant woman. Um, I, I, I got one right here if you want to ask. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but what I'm trying to say is that, you know, airplanes weren't always so flipping commonplace, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, now you, you take all these flights all over the place. So sure. space travel isn't right now. It's not commonplace, but we are so on the verge of it being commonplace. I know we keep saying that, but it's true. It's we're so like true. right there. Uh, we can't quite figure out where that tipping point is going to be when we go closer from... every day. Yeah. Oh, but we're so close. We're so close. So the, the more... I suppose the more it happens, the more commonplace it is, the more people that are going to want to do it because other people haven't done it before, mm -hmm. you know, or people are going to be wanting to do it again. Sure, right? yeah, absolutely. I've done x -Corps, now I want to do Virgin Galactic and see mm -hmm. what the differences are. You know, just because you've been on one roller coaster doesn't mean you've been on every single roller coaster, right? So uh, I think the more it happens, the more often it's going to happen, it's just, it's a trickle-down effect. It's sure. going to continue to go on. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone needed a car until, like, everyone needed a car, mm -hmm. right? I, so it's funny that we both read the exact same thing and All right. did that. Next comment. Uh, from Fabio Milan, also off of YouTube, helium three is more common in Mercury. The closer to the sun, the more abundant. Yep. I'm so glad you added that one. Well, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about helium three being an enabler even earlier in this right. episode, um, and some of the advantages of helium three um, and what it could potentially do in the future. Uh, you know, for now, going to our moon to mine helium three is kind of the it makes a lot of sense. There's, right. I forgot the number, but we estimate there's like 3,000 years worth of helium-3 up there to power the planet. Or There's enough helium-3 up on the moon to power the planet for like 3,000 years. Those aren't real numbers, but it's, it's something, something ridiculous like that. like that. And then when you run out there, the point is, and the reason I put it in the comments is, it's just go go to the entities closer to the sun and go grab more. Sure. Right? Because it's it's an, it's a byproduct of the those solar wind kind of coming in. Which the magnetosphere, the reason there isn't a lot on Earth is the magnetosphere. Uh, Vax Hedrum in the uh, chat room would like to disagree with that comment. It says more abundant on Neptune. Well, it's going to be, so, you know. so a planet with a magnetosphere like Earth, that's going to repel the solar winds. Sure. It's not going to be abundant on. So it doesn't matter where it's abundant. The point of it is... Yes, go somewhere else. So go to the moon, 
Go to Mars, go to Neptune, go to wherever you, although it's going to be hard to, anyhow, go, go wherever <laughs> and explore the solar system because there are amazing things out there that we can utilize and there's an in, essentially an infinite astrosat for a supply of anything that you could need. All right, and I think, is this the last comment for the show? Yes. All right, cool, last comment. Yay, also from YouTube. Uh, Barbara for him says, whenever you read about successful people, you'll find that they have a specific goal for their project. By specific, I mean date, time, quantity, paint job, everything. NASA is adrift. Their goal is to, I don't know, build a rocket or something. The new space community needs a governing body, complete with a CEO-type spokesperson, someone with the authority and the charisma to say before this decade is out. Right. Um, I think that's two independent things. Right. The first being um, specific goal for the project uh, you know, and then looking at NASA saying that they're floundering. Right. Uh, I don't think NASA's floundering. NASA themselves has said, we want to go to Mars. Right. We really want to put humans on Mars. Where you're seeing the floundering is from our politicians who control what NASA's allowed to do. That's where the floundering is actually coming into play. And they go, okay, that's great. That's great, NASA. You need to build a rocket. And NASA's like, we just want to go to Mars. We just want to go to Mars. And what really needs to happen is uh, Congress needs to say, okay, Ma NASA, mm -hmm. go to Mars. Send humans to Mars. You have 10 years to do it. Figure it out. We did it with the moon. We could do it with Mars as well. That's not what's happened. Right, right. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't blame NASA. The engineers I know at NASA, they're all... I mean, they, they want to do a bunch of stuff. They want to explore the cosmos. That's what the people, the engineers, and the scientists the at, NASA, at NASA... That's why they work at NASA. That's <laughs> what they want to do. Um, it's just that sometimes, most of the time, they're just not allowed to do a lot of that stuff because of politics. Uh, the second side of that is the new space community needs a governing body. Um, I would argue, no, they need anything but. Right now, the new space community needs the freedom to do what they need to do in order to fail early and fail hard. Mm -hmm. And they need to be able to go up and fly hardware and not have people overlooking them and saying, this is what you need to do. Now, that may not be what you mean, but that's how I took it. Um, you know, and you, you've kind of got the Elon figure saying, hey, yeah, we're going to Mars. It would be nice to have more people in New Space say, you know, my company's going to do this. Right. Um, but not a governing body per se, just the CEOs of these companies saying, look, we're going to the moon. Right, we're setting right. up a new lunar colony. Look, we're going to go to Mars. We're setting up a Martian colony. We're going to do this. And having a lot of these CEOs say, we're going to do these and having these big grand ideas that they can back up. Right. And that's key because if you have this big, you know, I could say, hey. Tomorrow's gonna to build a lunar colony, and y'all look at you look at me and go, "That's an awesome idea. I love that plan." There's no way you can execute on that, and all of that would be correct, right? Yeah. I have no idea how to build a lunar colony. I would love to build a lunar colony. I do not have the funding. I do not have the technical resources to do it. I cannot do it. So we need these companies that have these the credibility mm -hmm. to come up with these grand ideas and plans to make these things happen. Agree? Comment. All right, cool. That's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. If you're watching live, stay tuned. After Dark is up next. Otherwise, if you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, you can get this After Dark episode right away as soon as we post it over at patreon.com slash TMRO. Everyone, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in a week.